At this particular time, there are all kinds of people who are located in the Tenderloin, like prostitutes, homosexuals, uh, alcoholics, uh, what we may call straight people, as well as hippies, all kinds of ethnic groups, you name it, and we've got it in the Tenderloin. But Glide has tried uh, to be that kind of uh, church which uh, expresses itself and its concerns for the total community. Our job, Mark Forrester and, and me, you know, the, the two of us, as we were trying to give, help people have a voice, was to get them together. I mean, first of all, we listened to them. We encountered them. We, we asked them about what they were experiencing. And so part of what we were doing was doing sort of a survey of what was going on. We also talked to people in agencies that were serving this community. But we knew that finally these people of the Tenderloin of the Central City had to be empowered to have their own voice. And so we were getting them together and Vanguard was one expression of that. Um, but there were other organizations that we put together uh, drawing people together to express their concerns and to share with each other and then took them to do demonstrations uh, to the um, various city and county agencies. As, as a result of our community organizing work that took many months and several demonstrations and talking to lots of people and publicity, uh, the Central City area did get established as a target area for the anti-poverty program. Uh, we were up against other obstacles. In fact, Glide itself was experiencing some split over this because Cecil Williams was very active in the African American community and they were the beneficiaries of one of the anti-poverty program areas. And the sense was, well, the, we've only got so much money, this pie of money, and it's divided four ways now, if you divide it still another way, then you're going to have less money for each of the other target areas. And so there was this competition over how much money was going to be available. And so all the politics of that got involved. But yes, we succeeded in getting voice uh, so that people felt that they were heard and as a result, monies began to flow into the area. And at that time, of course, the uh, police were harassing gays and so forth uh, on the streets a lot. And so that was a major concern, and that was one of the major involvements uh, that I had. But I also learned that early on that uh, many of the cops were Irish, Catholic. So I, I never wore a collar before, but I put one on <laughs> every time I went to jail. And uh, I got in, you know, they would say, yes, Father. <laughs> I got a lot of respect. In fact, I would get calls, you know, late at night, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning um, by kids who got arrested from the cops. And um, they would say, you know, I, I got arrested, I'm in jail, oh. bail me out. <laughs> I said, okay, hang on to 10 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, I'll be there. And uh, at that time, I owned a um, Sunbeam sports car. And I used that, that car has been used so many times as collateral for bail. <laughs> Uh, I was lucky that the kids always showed up to court because otherwise I would have lost my means of transportation in San Francisco. It was one of those places where, again, we were building trust and helping people to realize that, yeah, the Glide Church and its program, we're here to be supportive and we care about you. And it was out of those experiences that eventually this Vanguard organization got started. And um, it, it was... Um, it was one of the elements of the community organizing that was being done throughout the Tenderloin to try to qualify for the anti-poverty program that didn't at that time include the Central City area. And it was, um, so it was one dimension of this effort to try to give people a voice who didn't have voice at that time. Early on, just as kind of helping to build the experience of fellowship was uh, around Thanksgiving and Christmas, we had um, 
special get-together uh, turkey dinner uh, in the basement of the Glide Church. And this was put on by this, these young adults, and of course with the support of the church and providing resources. I also started uh, with Vanguard Friday and Saturn, Saturday night dances in the basement of Glide. I believe these, these were probably the first gay dances sponsored by a church. <laughs> so, these, um, so these members of Vanguard, these um, drag queens and young gay men and others that identified with some dimension of this community, didn't feel like they had a lot of options of other places to go. And so when Compton started saying, we don't want you here, and started kicking them out, they felt this was really uh, unfair to them and it was really cutting into what they needed as a resource for their own life and quality of life. And so they organized and picketed Comptons to express their outrage at what was done. And of course, Comptons didn't like that. Um, but that was, the, that was the first time, I think, that Vanguard really took a joint action to try to express their concern about an issue that affected them and affected them very personally in terms of a place that they could go to get the, um, have that environment of a place that felt safe and food and fellowship, friendship, time sharing that, that they needed apart from a gay bar or, or just being on the street. I don't remember at what point I went in and talked to Compton's management and, you know, try to work out a way. See, my, my whole goal was not having to arrest people, but having people understand what they could do and what they shouldn't do and so forth and so on. Well, I needed to know what we needed to know about Compton's in order to make recommendation to people. Uh, <clears throat> I learned a long time ago do something, maybe it's not appropriate, but that's the way I did things. Um, I never hid my phone number. My phone number was always in the book. And I'd get a call at home, but I wouldn't answer the phone. My wife at that time would answer the phone. And uh, she'd say, oh, well, he's not here right now, but I'll, I'll have him call you in the morning. Well, then I would call the individual back the next day, and you know, it's amazing how many problems that are problems right now aren't problems tomorrow. One of the best things I feel we had was I knew a doctor at the Center for Special Problems, the doctor who was head of it. Is that Joel Fort? Yeah. And so I went to Joel and I said, look, I've got people who need help and you're not giving it to them up there. And he said, well, tell me about your people. And so I did. And so he started the Center for Special Problems evaluating people. And he worked with uh, Stanford and with the surgeon down there that did the job. Donald Laub? Yeah, that's the fellow. Who? Uh, Dr. Brown. Who oh, Dr. Brown. yeah. I think, was he the guy had his office. Where was it? Out off of Van Ness? Uh, well, he had an office on Lombard Street, and uh, then he did some of his surgeries at the Jack Tar Motel. Uh, I, I remember his name. I remember a doctor that we went and called on because he was obviously a quack. And I think that was Dr. Brown. But seemed to me that medical society stomped all over him, if I remember correctly. I really believe that most of the people who came in felt more confident about dealing with other people like me when they talked to my two secretaries who were both transsexuals. Uh, there were a lot of hotels in the Tenderloin. And if you paid your rent, they didn't care what you wore. I know that there were transsexual people throughout San Francisco. 
they lived out in the sunset. They lived in the mission. Uh, matter of fact, I talked about Louise Durkin. When I first knew her, she lived in the downtown area. Then she moved out into mission. And then ultimately, she moved up to the Russian River, she and Jerry. I remember there was an incident at the um, Examiner Chronicle printing plant. Did you remember that from history? In uh, October of 1969. Okay. Yes. Well, I was there, and the tax squad was there, and then there was some just plain ordinary policemen there, uh, including my buddy Saul Wiener. And uh, the fellow who wrote for the examiner, I think his name was Patterson, um, <clears throat> the gay community came out to demonstrate against him. But what they didn't realize, he was there he was marching in their demonstration, carrying a little basket, singing a tisk at a tasket. I found my little basket. And had they been aware he was there, why they would have really raised hell with him because they were demonstrating against him. But what happened then was the situation got a little bit out of hand. All of the printers went up on the roof and took ink and then dumped ink over the side of the building down on the gay marchers. So in return, they took all the ink they could get and slapped it all over the building. But they didn't feel that was sufficient. So they decided they would go into the building and go up on the roof and get these printers well, they got over to the door, and my friend Saul Wiener was there, and he said, no, you're not coming in. And uh, so the situation got a little bit out of line. People started hustling, uh, trying to work their way in, and then the tax squad moved in. And we have an old expression in the police department, and that is, clubs are Trump. Well, clubs were Trump then. If you were gay trying to get into the examiner building, you were have to get thumped. So, uh, Saul, this, this is going to lead to a story about Ray Rocher. Saul um, <clears throat> was trying to bring this one guy to the wagon, and the guy was resisting him mightily, and so I came over to help him. So then the guy sunk his hand or sunk his teeth into Saul's hand. And uh, so we had a little trouble dislocating him and we got him loaded in the wagon, taken away. So Ray Brochier's after that would spread the story around the tenderloin. You know, come Halloween, because Saul was bit by a gay man, come Halloween at midnight, Saul is going to turn gay. <laughs> and I've been kidding him about that for, for years now. So what happened was, in late 1974, there was a captain who shall remain nameless uh, who had a very good job with the police department, and he didn't like anybody dealing with these people. And so he arranged for me, if I wanted to stay a sergeant, then I uh, listened to his suggestion about my transfer to Mission Station. I could say, I don't want to go to Mission. he said, OK, fine, you can go back to being a patrolman again. That was not my idea of fun. So. <laughs> being transferred in my last few months uh, to a mission station. The captain out there didn't really know how to deal with somebody like me. And that's when I had started out at mission station by having the beat out there in the Castro.